All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, if you didn't see a program um, or get an email, I'm Paul, and I am here this evening to give a present a lecture on the subject of the occult secrets of Jesus, the man, the master, and the healer. First of all, let me actually say thank you very, very much for coming and to see uh, what essentially is a full house here at the Bodhi Tree goes a long way to restoring my faith in humanity. I'm also very grateful to the divas for holding off with their storm. And I'm very grateful that astrologers are not always right, at least those who had predicted that today being the winter solstice and the full moon and an eclipse of the full moon, it was the day that the Mayans predicted the world would end. So I'm very glad that that has not come to pass. So far, so far. The vast majority, or at least a great deal, of what I will share with you this evening has been given to us in the Ethereum Society by our spiritual uh, master and founder, a man called Dr. George King. Some of you probably already know something about Dr. George King, and I'm, not, I'm just going to go into that very, very briefly. Uh, Dr. George King uh, was himself a great master of yoga. He was born in England in 1919, and at an early age began to study the occult sciences. In his early 20s, coming out of the Second World War, in which he had served as a conscientious objector, being extremely concerned by the world as it was at that time, a world that had not only discovered once again atomic energy and used this in a very, very destructive way, it caused him to be extremely concerned about the human race. And he began to study yoga, which was quite unusual in the 1940s, certainly in England. And he did this over the next 10 years, up to eight hours a day. And the result of such intensive practice was that he caused, or naturally caused, through, through that intense spiritual practice, a fluid that we all have in the base of our spine, called the Kundalini, to rise through a channel in the spine called the Sushumna channel, opening up the chakras or psychic centers until he was able to go into the, into the state known as the goal of yoga by yoga masters of samadhi. And it was with this ability to enter a yogic samadhic trance that he was used by masters upon this world and even masters beyond this earth. And so much of, I, of what I will share has either come through Dr. King while he was in this state or from his own yogic knowledge and experience. So that's the majority of the source. Now, let me ask you first of all, who in this room, in this Bodhi tree annex, believes that they have lived on earth before in a previous life? Good. It's almost unanimous, which makes my job a little bit easier. And my next question is, who in this room, in the Bodhi tree annex, believes that we have had a previous civilization on this earth, most recently Atlantis. Good, good. I don't know if it's unanimous, but certainly the vast majority. And even before that, a civilization known as Lemuria. Thank you. And it's from what we know of those civilizations, which is not a lot, you'll probably find out more if you go into the actual bookstore here of the Bodhi tree. The understanding certainly is that it was a civilization similar to the civilization we have today. Certainly they had discovered atomic power, even more so, the capability even greater than what we have today. And both of those two civilizations were destroyed through the gross misuse of that atomic power. The reason that those two civilizations were destroyed 
is because there was amongst the majority of the people living on this earth a very lackadaisical attitude, a lack of interest, a lack of care. They were not fundamentally, primarily concerned with the purpose of their life on this earth and the truth. With the yogis, the yogis say that if you want to have enlightenment, and I think we all do, then, you, then your hair must be on fire and you must be rushing to water to put, put it out. You must have this great intensity for enlightenment, for, for truth. And when we look at our world today, and particularly when we look at Christmas today, how apparent is it that we are desperately seeking the truth and to understand the purpose of our life? Because I've brought along some of these symbols of Christmas today. Father Christmas. Here he is again, um, and a snowman, and a bell, and I'm not terribly sure what this little thing is here. But he's in red and white, which kind of means Christmas. And when we think of Christmas, I'm sure everybody, most of the people on our planet, at least those in the Western world and those with access to computers, know that it has something to do with a, with a man called Jesus a long time ago. And we know that we, it's a time when we, we hopefully can relax. We say, Happy Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. It is a time when we, when, when we are able, hopefully, to relax a little bit, although it's also, I understand, a very stressful time. But we get a day off work in America. In England, you get two days off work, which is a little bit better, and then you've got New Year coming up in a few days' time. So you try and sort of take a few days off in the middle and have a little vacation. And it's a time, yes, when we get together with family and friends, if we can, and we share food, and, me, and, uh, and we drink together. And you always generally have very good sporting activities. I see that the Lakers are playing here on Christmas Day. And you possibly will go and take in a show or go to the movies. And you've probably also seen here in Hollywood that there's a, there's a big uh, new film coming out tomorrow, uh, True Grit. I'm sure that many, many people will be going to see this and other films over the Christmas period. But there will be... I'm going on past experience, remarkably little interest in the man and the reason for Christmas in the first place. And it hasn't always been like that. Because if you go to Europe, you will see that some of the, arguably the greatest buildings that we have, great cathedrals, were built in the name of this master, this yogi who walked our earth 2,000 years ago. And some of the greatest art was inspired. If you go back to, to, to periods like the Renaissance, this great flowering of learning was devoted to this great master. And some of the great artists became deeply spiritual. And it was the inspiration behind their art. And likewise, some of our greatest music was inspired by this master. But in our world today, where we have nuclear capability, where we have potential to destroy our civilization once again, we have let next, to, to next to no interest in the master, the great avatar who walked this earth 2,000 years ago. And we can say, does it matter? And I think it matters a very great deal. And yet, interestingly, it's a metaphor for one of the great occult secrets of this master. What we know of the great master Jesus was a disguise for his main mission. And his main mission, and this is an occult secret, 
It's not commonly known. It's alluded to. But his main mission on earth was not to teach and to heal the sick and the, bl the blind and make the blind see, to manifest fish and bread. Although these were great abilities that he had, his main mission was to die. The main mission of the Master Jesus was to die. And the reason for that was to take tremendous karma, or rather, let me rephrase that. The reason for that was to avert a catastrophe that was due upon earth at that time, caused by the wrong thought and action of mankind. And the days of Rome were not too dissimilar to our world today. I have a description here, I won't read it right now, but it's possibly true. It doesn't matter too much if it is or it isn't. By a Roman called Lucullus, I think, who gave a description of Jesus to the Emperor Tiberius. The Emperor Tiberius in Rome, there was, there was great scheming, there was backstabbing, there was the, there was the uh, rush for power, there was the killing of nephews and all this kind of stuff going on. And Tiberius himself was succeeded, I think, I think I'm right, and if I'm not right, and I'm very close, by one of the greatest pawns of the black magicians in the history of our world. It was a time of slaying, of massacre, of cruelty, of corruption in every field of life. And the energy that we put out, and I'm sure you're all metaphysicians and all familiar with the law of karma, which Jesus, of course, taught very succinctly by saying, as you sow, so must you reap. The energy that we had put out, the human race, had to come back. And it would have brought about a great destruction on earth at that time. And Jesus came to avert that. And you, and you might ask, well, how did he do it? How was that possible? And we'll look at that in a moment. We do think that there is another master coming. Uh, we don't know exactly when. That's the subject, perhaps, of another talk. But the, where I want to go now with this is to look at how one individual, one man, one master, could literally, if you like, take away the sins of the world, of all of us. And let me just add on the end of that, that again, we do not believe, or agree with, I should probably say, in the ethereal society that one can literally do whatever one likes in life and then say, well, because I believe in Jesus, I'm going to be saved. He's going to take away all of my karma. We don't go along with that. We believe we're responsible for our own karma. But had Jesus not intervened at that time to manipulate his death, his own death, in this brilliant, brilliantly cunning way, then collectively the human race would have, would have experienced some kind of terrible calamity. All right, so how is it possible? Well, if we go back to the time 2,000 years ago, number one, we all thought that the world was flat. And we all, I won't say, we, probably the, well, the vast majority of the world um, thought that the world was flat. And they thought that the earth was the center of the universe. And we were very primitive in our, in our science and our technology. We didn't obviously have electricity. We didn't have things like satellites that we could put up into space. We didn't have telescopes like the Hubble telescope that we have today 
to give us a very, very, very different perspective on life. I was having a very interesting conversation a few days ago, an interfaith group I belonged to, and we were having breakfast. And we got into this very interesting discussion. And I was quite amazed that um, he, he said, oh, no, no, there was no virgin birth. And this other chap picked him. That's absolutely right. There was no virgin birth. And I was quite amazed to hear these very sort of orthodox Christian people being quite so adamant about that. And we, we got into a discussion. He said, well, it's not terribly important to sort of, you know, make a big noise about this. Uh, although I should all ju just say there that we in the Ethereum Society do believe in the virgin birth. So, you know, we, had a we were having a little bit of a dialogue going on there. But what came out of it was the fact that if the likes of Copernicus and Galileo hadn't taken up on a theme and stuck to it, and despite persecution, despite contradiction and maltreatment, then we would not at that time have come to know that the earth is not the center of the universe, and nor is it flat. And that began that great flowering that renaissance that I referred to, what led later to the age of enlightenment. And um, I believe, and I believe this 100% categorically, and I think I know there's one or two others in this room also feel the same way. In fact, this is, this, is, this is at the very heart and root of the Ethereum society. And that is the idea, more than the idea, the, ab the absolute knowledge, if you like, the truth, that the other planets in our solar system are inhabited. They're inhabited. There are other realms around this world where we go when we die, awaiting rebirth, depending on our own karmic pattern. But so likewise are there other realms around the other planets in our solar system. And this one single piece of knowledge, and I would say, with both feet on the ground, absolute truth is the threshold that the human race are now standing on. And it will revolutionize our thinking on this earth. We have, this is a little bit off topic, but we have to come together as a human race. Beyond all the differences of religion and, and, and racism and, and, and nationality that we've created for ourselves. Because if we don't, like Lemuria and Atlantis, we will destroy ourselves. And so Jesus, an occult secret of Jesus. In fact, if you read Revelation chapter 22, and I, don't ask me for the verse, but he, he said, I am from the bright and morning star. And what they would have known then is that the bright and morning star because they didn't, because they had much better sky, night skies, is Venus. Jesus was from Venus, which really shouldn't be so revolutionary. If you compare our solar system and certainly our galaxy to Los Angeles, Venus is, is closer than next door. Venus is closer than next door. And the civilizations on these other planets within our solar system are infinitely more evolved, spiritually evolved, than we are on this Earth. But it is nonetheless where we are all going. I remember when I first started getting interested, and I will say in spirituality, and I will say that I came, uh, I was looking for something in my life this, this, that, I, that I knew to be missing, and this is over 25 years ago. And I didn't know where to turn. I'd grown up in England. The only faith that I, that I grew up in, well, the faith I grew up in was the Anglican Church. So I read St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I realized here was someone who completely understood the way we should be living on this world, which is what troubled me at that time, and the, as did the state of the world. And uh, I remember, again, reading around that time, it was in the early 1980s, an article by the great... Russian, he was Soviet, well, he's Russian, uh, philosopher Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And I remember what he said because I think he summed it up exactly. 
He said, the trouble with the West, and I think he probably should have said the world doesn't matter, but he said, the trouble with the West is that it has lost its consciousness of God. We've lost our consciousness of God. And I think here in, in Matthew, again, I think it's chapter 22, I can't remember the verse, but Jesus is asked by one of the followers or someone who was curious. He said, give, he said to Jesus, give me the bottom line. What is it really all about? What are you really saying? What were the commandments saying? What is it all about? And Jesus replied with these words. He said to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The God that Alexander Solzhenitsyn was referring to. The God that is absolutely everywhere and in every single thing. It's everywhere. It's all that, it is. It's all that there is. And when one has that realization, one begins to appreciate what it is to be alive. This gift, this miracle, this, this absurd thing, from where has it come? This life that we have. And where is it going? And to then notice it in nature. How perfect everything is. How ordered everything is. What a miracle everything is. And to love this with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the trouble is in our dumbed down world, we have lost that consciousness. And he also said, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, upon those two things hangs everything else. This threshold that we're standing on, that um, as Jesus himself said, here I can give you chapter and verse, John chapter 14, verse 2. In my Father's house, in God's house, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. There are many mansions. It's teeming with life out there. Talk just a little bit um, about life on the other planets and how on that base it, it basis it is possible for a master, for an avatar from another world to come and take the karma of mankind. I should say that um, in 1961, in February and March, Dr. King, as I mentioned at the beginning, the founder of the Ethereum Society, would go into what we call a positive yogic somatic trance so that masters could speak through him. And a master who goes by the name of Mars Sector 6 delivered this set of transmissions we call the Nine Freedoms. And they outline um, our, our journey th through uh, evolution, if you like, within, our, within this solar system. And I'll run through these very, very briefly. But the first, the first step, the first essential step that we have to take is bravery. Um, bravery to, bravery to uh, stand up for truth, if you like. Bravery to honor one's conscience. Uh, not, not to be afraid of truth, uh, ho however contradictory it may be. Um, if, if one's conscience tells it to be so. Um, and the second freedom is love, um, which is kind of behind that sense of truth, that sense of honesty that bravery requ requires. And when one is living coming from that space, the third freedom is service. Instead of being a selfish life, you, you're looking to way, in fact, to help other people. And this brings about the fourth freedom, which is enlightenment. This is a very sure path, a timeless path towards enlightenment, that gaining of, uh, of this kind of consciousness that we're talking about, this higher dimension of consciousness. And then even beyond that uh, enlightenment, uh, the fifth freedom is a state of cosmic consciousness, which Christ, of course, demonstrated. Christ had that. Uh, he probably, he, he brought it with him. It's our understanding um, that 
uh, Jesus was not actually born on December the 25th. That was a pagan holiday for the winter solstice. Uh, he was actually born on March, March the 15th, the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March, as the Romans used to say. Uh, in the springtime, when, the, when, when shepherds were watching their flocks, and Christ came in as the Piscean master. He brought in the Piscean age, if you like. Remember those early Christians, they would draw a fish. One would draw a fish and the other would draw a fish to recognize each other as a form of safety, symbol of, of Pisces. Um, and, and nor, nor do we think that the star of Bethlehem was one of those suns, the far too big to hover over stables. Uh, we, we recognize it as having been uh, uh, what we call today a flying saucer, an extraterrestrial craft. Um, nothing new about those. The, the Bible itself is full of sightings of UFOs, and you look in the Sanskrit texts and you'll find uh, many references also there. They were called um, Vimanas. So we think that Jesus, an, an aspect of Jesus, the Venusian, came uh, in that craft known as the Star of Bethlehem. Um, and while he was on earth, of course, you know, people wonder what happened to him in those, in those sort of teenage years um, in a transmission uh, from the master of theorists. Back in the 1950s, Dr. King would go into a positive yogic somatic trance. Uh, that is Dr. King there, if you've never seen a picture of him. Um, and from time to time, you'd have, there'd be a two-way conversation whereby people in the audience could ask questions of the, of, of the master, most commonly the master of theorists from whom we take our name, another Venusian master. And here, um, the questioner says, can you give us any information about what happened to Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30? Aetherius. He did, of course, leave the planet several times. He visited Mars, Saturn, his own planet Venus, and also Jupiter. He also spent some time with certain initiates and what you would call masters in the secret retreats throughout Terra. He went to the retreats in Egypt, the Himalayas, America, and in the Andes. As you have no doubt gathered, he did visit England as a boy. And it was probably while visiting some of those retreats, um, uh, also visited, we understand, by John the Baptist, um, who it seems, this whole bit about reincarnation, Jesus says, who do they say I am and the, from, you know, from a previous life? And they think that they sort of believed that John the Baptist had been Elijah who would come before the Messiah. But anyway, during that period, Jesus would have, have learned the yogic abilities that you can read about, go and get the book if you haven't got it, Autobiography of a Yogi, where Jesus would have learned how to levitate, in other words, walk on water, how to manifest thought uh, in terms of supplying bread and, and, and fish or whatever else, turning water into wine. Um, Healing, healing the sick, even raising the dead. These, these abilities are possible. They're actually there for all of us. I mean, we, we, if only we knew what we are a part of, we would change the world overnight. Venusian masters, they live for anywhere between about five and 7,000 years in the same body. Um, so what seems to us like a very long time ago, 2,000 years ago, to them is still part of their same incarnation. This great avatar, just address this question, uh, answer this question um, about how would it be possible for a master to take away the sins of, of the whole world. Well, the fifth freedom I mentioned is cosmic consciousness. The sixth freedom which Christ demonstrated is ascension. And we will go through the, the, the whole, the, the whole uh, ritual, paraphernalia, whatever you want to call it, of rebirth. And uh, the whole purpose being to raise the Kundalini, to consciously raise the Kundalini into the higher psychic center so that we can experience cosmic consciousness. And when we can bring about the state of cosmic consciousness at will, then we've overcome the lessons we're here to learn on this planet. And we will, as Christ demonstrated, ascend. We will go beyond death. But we don't ascend as is perhaps commonly understood uh, back to God. There is a whole universe for us to interact with. Um, and one might ask why. And the way I answer that particular question is I remember years ago as a student in England um, having seen a film. You might remember it. It was The Deer Hunter. 
Anybody see the deer hunter? Uh, I was a student at the time, and I thought, man, that was just a fantastic film. And my, um, my housemate, my flatmate, as you call him over there, he hadn't seen it. And so I remember say, and I, I said to him, I envy you. I envy you because you haven't seen it yet. You don't know what is in store for you. And I think that this is the truth of life and experience. We do not know what there is in store for us. We wouldn't want to go just back to God, back to oblivion, if you like, because the journey just becomes more and more and more incredible and fantastic as we evolve. We just don't know what we are a part of. And this, this whole, uh, this, this lack of consciousness of God, this lack of awareness that, that our planet is so in desperate, desperate, desperate need of, it will change the world overnight when we realize what we are a part of. Um, then we will, we will rapidly, if, if that's the case, I, I, sorry to take up this time, but there's another wonderful, there's a yoga story about a, a, a yoga master walking through India, and he comes across uh, a sannyasin or a student who's been sitting um, in a yogic posture for years, so long that a, and ants are crawling around him, and he's not fidgeting. He's able to sit there with all these ants crawling all over him. And, and as he sees the master, he sort of telepaths to the master, master, how much longer, how many more lives will I need before I gain enlightenment. And the master looks at him and he can see he's doing a very fine job and he says, you will have four more lives. And then he sees a guy playing the absolute fool, a complete idiot, a lunatic if you like. And the lunatic calls out to the master, hey master, how many more lives am I gonna have before I gain enlightenment? And the master looks at him and he says, you see that tree? You see how many leaves there are on that tree? You will have as many lives as there are on that tree. And that man in that moment realizes that no matter what a fool he is, he is still destined to gain enlightenment. And he has it in that instant because he realizes what, what he's a part of, what he is, what it, what it is. And the kingdom of God is within. Um, so when we're able to have that state, bring about that state of cosmic consciousness that the Yogananda demonstrated, Shivananda, many yoga masters, the Lord Buddha demonstrated, another Venusian, uh, what Sri Krishna demonstrated, a Saturnian, even more evolved, um, demonstrated, uh, then we have literally broken the cycle of rebirth and we will have the experience of ascension. And we will ascend, but as in not back to God, but in the seventh freedom to interplanetary existence upon one of the other planets within our solar system. Um, specifically, I believe, Mars and Jupiter. That's uh, unless, that's unless we choose to remain on Earth in one of those retreats that the master of theorists was referring to, um, where we have what we commonly call the ascend, where the ascended masters are, St. Germain's and other such masters, uh, Lord Maitreya. They are ascended, but they've chosen to remain on this earth to help humanity in certain ways. So you have interplanetary existence is the seventh freedom. Beyond that, the Eighth Freedom, Saturnian existence. Very, 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 very evolved culture, civilization. And in the Ninth Freedom, beyond that, solar existence. I won't say any more. Uh, this is one of the great books of the Aetherius Society. It's one of the great books of, the of, the, of any metaphysical library, the Nine Freedoms. Um, so Jesus came here with tremendous capability from a very... Uh, cultured, advanced planetary system. Mars is able to travel through this solar system and even throughout the galaxy. And it was because of his ability, if we were to put, perhaps look at it in a slightly different way, were well, we to go down to a very, very, very low level, to, um, to a very low level of creature, we would be able to help those creatures because of our uh, ad relative advancement and choosing to um, uh, bring ourselves down out of compassion 
for those creatures to help those creatures. And it was because this great avatar with tremendous ability to, uh, chose to limit himself, to greatly limit himself, uh, suffer this most terrible crucifixion for humanity that he took upon himself the karma, or, or some of the karma, I probably should say, some of the karma of the world. And that is the great avatar, the great master, that this celebration that we now have, albeit at the wrong date. If you come to the Ethereum Society, please do come to the Ethereum Society. We'd love to have you come to the Ethereum Society. Come on March the 15th. We always have a commemoration service for the Master Jesus on Mar March the 15th. In the original email, um, it asks the question, has Jesus come again? And I, put, and I should just uh, answer that one um, quickly. Jesus actually says, I've never left you. Jesus spoke through Dr. George King on a number of times, and we're going to play one of those what we call cosmic transmissions for you this evening. We, if there's time, we might even play two. But most specifically, in 1958, on 12 consecutive Sundays, Dr. George King, following a very strict yogic regimen, went into this positive yogic somatic trance so that the Master Jesus, who in one sense has never left us, could speak through him. To give to humanity, in this new age of science and technology, unlike 2,000 years ago, a cosmic extension, if you like, to his Sermon on the Mount, because we're going to need it. We can't just go out there and stick in our um, star-spangled ban uh, banner uh, on the moon and claim it in the name of the United States of America or China or any other country. It isn't. It isn't there. As the Native Americans have tried to tell us, you can't actually own anything. It's given to us to develop the right kind of appreciation for what we're a part of. Um, and the, as I mentioned, I, I, when I started this whole journey, this my own spiritual journey, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as I told you. So, and I was, go, uh, I was going to Westminster Abbey, then I went to another church in England, and I became quite active, very active. Uh, and it was a, a centre for London's homeless people, St. Martin's in the Fields in Trafalgar Square, a wonderful church. So it was quite a surprise for me to be introduced to this. I was, I was born in 1958. So what do you mean Jesus speaking in 1958 through this so-called Western master of yoga, George King? But I tell you this, I listened to these blessings. I started going along uh, on Sunday mornings, and we always play one of these 12 blessings. And I would go along there in the morning before going to Evensong at St. Martin's in the field later on in the day, taking in Speaker's Corner in the afternoon, if you know Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. Um, but I listened to these. And you know what? Like Mahatma Gandhi said, um, he who does not change his mind in the light of greater reason is a fool. Because there was a purity in here. There was, there was a truth in here. There was a profundity and, uh, uh, in here and just straight, absolute, if you like, pure goodness. There was nothing egotistical about it. It, was, it resonated with me very, very deeply. And as a result, I could not ignore it. I'm going to run through these blessings very quickly, like I did with the, well, even quicker than I did with the Nine Freedoms. The first blessing is, blessed are they who work for peace. And Jesus gives this wonderful demonstra uh, this uh, explanation of they who are working for peace. The second blessing is, blessed are the wise ones who walk through a dark and ignorant world spreading their light. Masters like Yogananda and Vivekananda and Shivananda and others. The third blessing, blessed are they who love, for they are the disciples of God. The fourth blessing is blessed are the planetary ones, such as Jesus and Buddha and others who have, who have sacrif uh, sacrificed peace, sacrificed friendship, sacrificed, thank sac sacrificed their very salvation for you. 
Fifth, fifth blessing is blessed are the thanksgivers who give their thanks to the nature kingdom, the Levic forces. The sixth blessing, which is the one we're going to play for you, because this is partly also a healing presentation tonight, is blessed are they who heal in these days of great pain and suffering. And here more of the cosmic bit. The seventh blessing, blessed, is the Mother Earth as an aspect of this one God of which we are all a part. She is a living being. She's a highly evolved living being. She's been here for billions of, well, at least three and a half billion years. And in the 18 odd million years that humanity has been on this Earth, and that's another lecture from another planet we destroyed, namely Maldek, the asteroid belt, 18 million years ago. Uh, an 18, uh, just one, if, you, if you think of three and a half billion years as a 24 hour day, then the 18 million years that we've been here is the last seven and a half minutes that mankind has been on this earth. And in those seven and a half minutes, we've destroyed Lemuria and we've destroyed Atlantis and we've dropped bombs on Hiroshima and, and Hiroshima, which was nothing compared to what we were doing in 1958 when we dropped over 100 hydrogen bombs. We tested, why do you, it's like whaling. Why have you got to kill so many whales? You, you do your experiments with just one. But with, it, it, in 1958, the world dropped 100 hydrogen bombs, testing them. Each one equivalent of a thousand atom bombs the size of those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Did we ask the Earth if we could do that madness? And so how we have completely mistreated this planet, taken it utterly for granted, and what is the result? The terrible environmental crisis that we have on our world today. We have to change. Um, a beautiful blessing to the Mother Earth. The eighth blessing is a blessing to the sun. To the sun as a living being. The ninth blessing is a blessing to the supreme lords of karma. Who hold all of this in perfect balance. The tenth blessing, which I'd have liked to have shown you. Uh, there isn't time, but it's a beautiful, beautiful blessing. It's a blessing to the galaxy. Uh, the galaxy is a living being. The eleventh blessing is a blessing to the supreme lords of all creation who have brought all of this into manifest. All that we saw there, the supreme lords of creation have brought into manifestation. And they even brought into manifestation the potential behind the manifestation. And the only reason I say that, it says in this most incredible, beautiful description of the supreme lords of creation, it says, these are the gods of the gods. These supreme lords of creation, these are the gods of the galaxies. These are the gods of the suns. These are the gods of the supreme lords of karma. And the reason I say that is because, coming back to us having lost our consciousness of God, in the twelfth blessing, which is a blessing to the absolute, there is the wonderful line given by this same master, the master Jesus, who says, I have never left you. He says, not even the supreme lords of all creation can do justice to the picturization of the magnificence of God. Like I said, it just keeps getting more and more and more and more incredible as we evolve. The more evolved we become, it just gets more and more fantastic. And that's the journey we're on. And that's what we have to realize. We, beyond the tragedy, virtually, that we've made of life and of Christmas, are you good to hear what we in the Ethereum Society was spoken by Jesus in 1958 through the Western Master of Yoga, Dr. George King? Okay. Thank you.
of great pain and suffering Of times these ones a sacrifice of their own a peace so that others I may benefit a thrice blessed are these ones a for this holy sacrifice I am Jesus who stepped upon this world to bring the way to God through love and service. I now bless those who give a service Uh, to me, to their brothers, and to God in this way. Thrice blessed are the healers. For they will bring light into my church. For they are the ones who, when the time is ripe, will lead my church. So endeth the sixth blessing. O sweet ones, go with God.